We're so happy to have you here. You know, that's the backup one. I just made it here for your brief visit. And Kimberly, can you say something just so our audio is working? I can. Can you hear me? You can hear me? Yes? Oh, I'm talking. I'm not sure anybody can hear me. Go ahead, Kimberly, say hello again. Hi, Joshua. Can you hear me now? I know that's okay. No. Do you think it's just my computer or is it other people? Oh, there we go. All right. Let me switch. Sure. I can hear you here. I, can, I can hear Kimberly. Okay. I can hear you, Kimberly. I'm glad you can hear me. No, I am. All right. So, we're, are we ready? Okay. Yes. Thank you. And now we will call this meeting to order. Can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, motion for approval of minutes. So moved. Second. Any discussions? No. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Um, now we will go into adjourn to public hearing. Um, this is this is for the senior disability real property exemption. And at this time, we will um, have a moment for the public. If anyone has any questions, comments. There was, was there nobody on, online? To do the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Joanna, we, we do have Jay Franklin here. If um, anyone on the board had questions or anyone of the public had questions of Jay. Questions? Oh, okay. Um, thank you for, for, for coming, Jay. Um, a quick question about the $50,000 cap is that statewide and is that for a household income or is that for uh individual uh taxpayer mm -hmm. so the the fifty thousand is the highest uh, that the state will allow you in order to get a 50 percent exemption so the income is a um not individual it would be for all resident owners or uh, owners and their spouses as well. And income is defined a little bit differently. So th this is really your adjusted gross minus any IRA distributions that are uh, taxable. And then we add in all of the social security income, even the part that may not be taxable. And then there's about 38 other instances of what income is and what income is not Like we, we don't count capital losses, but we do add in capital gains. Any other questions for Jay? Any questions from the audience?
Is there anything, Jay, additional that you would like to present to the board? I think there was no, some I, uh, clarification, perhaps on a scale. Uh, or um, yep. Yeah. So what can happen is the uh, school district has a couple options. You can either just do a 50% exemption at one income limit, or you could have a sliding scale that decreases by about a thousand dollars per, um, or it reduces five percent by about every additional thousand dollars of income over that fifty percent. Then you can stop it at twenty percent, ten percent, and five percent. Right now, the school district, um, along with the vast majority of people in the county, go all the way down to that five percent uh, scale. Thank you. Did, did we want to put out there now that the um, um, it was asked last time, and um, we got your answers, Jay. Um, it was asked last time what the um, total number of exemptions there were on the median house um, in, and it's on a piece of paper in the district and um, that total was $732.81. And that, but not all of that is controlled by a school board. That's the sum total of all exemptions for the median house in the district. Um, and of that, the current, exemption um, for seniors is $60.07. And Jay has estimated that if we um, approve what the resolution that is um, written, it'll add an additional $20.61 estimated. Did I get all that right, Jay? Yes, I'm busily trying to pull up that email, but <laughs> yes, you, you you are correct. Uh, uh, the, the vast majority of exemptions that um, the school district offers are required by New York State. You know, there's really, I think, three that you have. You have the uh, alternative vets that you were one of the uh, only school districts to pass that, the low-income disability and the low-income senior, and then also the one um, land trust uh, parcel that was um, currently adopted. Everything else is mandated by New York State, such as exemptions for the school district and other government buildings and um, uh, ag land, things like that. But it, it was an interesting question because I've never got that question before. So it was fun for me to go and do that analysis. It's probably why Kimberly got it so quickly. It was like, ooh, something new. Let's look at this. Thank you. All right. Um, I will now wait. Sorry. Yes, I don't. Should I, I? I have some stuff to present. Well, should I do it now? And Martin uh, present as an in, info. You can speak. I, yeah. Okay. So um, I was asked last time by Jim like, when we were tabling the discussion what kind of information um, that I might want to look at um, in order to like wrap our, my head around like this um, this possible exemption. And so I went I went online. Now I'm. I have handouts, <laughs> so I'm a little embarrassed by this, but I'm going to do it because for me, I it's very hard for me to hear numbers um, when people are saying them, and I'm about to say a lot of numbers, and I wanted um, people to have them in front of them. So um, when I'm thinking about like what I mean, because basically it comes down to we have seniors that we want to help um, pay their tax bill, but then. Instead of the state state like funding that, it's actually being funded by other homeowners. And so we then have this balance between we want to give seniors a break, but because of the way this is structured, it's coming um, from other homeowners. And so then it's like what 
there's some income level at which we might not feel comfortable anymore. Um, uh, yeah, I have no. Um, and so I did, I went online and the first site I hit was um, at MIT. They have a living wage calculator. Um, and I just started looking at like, if you were uh, an adult with no kids in Tompkins, Seneca or Schuyler counties, those are counties, um, what would be the living wage? And it ranges from 31 to 38,000 a year. Um, but then I was thinking, okay, but that's like someone that's working and the living wage for someone that's working could be a lot different. I could think of a lot of ways that would be different when you retire. Um, and so I went and I tried to find something that um, gave a good assessment on um, the seniors that this would apply to. And I found um, a really great website. It was put out, it's put out by um, the University of Massachusetts at Boston. It's called the Elder Index. And the tagline is measuring the income older adults need to live independently. Um, and they use this for research purposes is the impression that I got. Um, interestingly for them, the, and you, if you go here, you can look by county all over the United States. Um, and so for them, the, you could toggle different variables and it was, um, there were three categories of variables that were um, important in this measurement and it was household size. So whether you're a single se senior or part of a couple, um, your housing status. So whether you rent, uh, you have a mortgage and then if you have a mortgage, whether that mortgage is paid off or not. Um, and then your health status. And so they called it poor, good and excellent. And basically you can toggle like all these and I kind of went with the extremes because Tompkins is the most expensive place to live. And I think Skyler was the least. Um, and so if you are a single senior living in Skyler County with a paid off mortgage and in excellent health, it comes out with $20,376 as being um, enough to live on independently. Whereas at the other extreme, if you're a coupled senior in Tompkins County um, with a mortgage that you're still paying on and in poor health, the number was 52 and a half thousand. So that gave like some sense of what a living wage, I guess, would be for seniors. And then when thinking about this too, I was like, because it came up last time that we're comparing this, like, so we're taking money from this set of people and we're giving it to seniors. And we were kind of talking about it last time as, um, well, are there people you know, working adults that make less than $35,000. And I started thinking, well, that's not really, because working adults also have kids and things, and kids are very expensive. And so I went back to the living wage calculator, MIT, and just plugged in some numbers for how much it would cost, um, oh, what a living wage is for one adult and one child in Tompkins County, that's $77,500. Um, if you are one adult and you have two children in Tompkins, um, just over $100,000 and two adults, both working with two children in Tompkins is almost $110,000. Um, so, which is all to say, I'm not really saying that this, but this just, it's complicated. This is a really complicated decision um, with a lot of factors that are really unknowable. And so I was just kind of putting that out there for everyone to see. Thank you for that. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education for the Transport Central School District hereby approves an increase in the income limit for the low income senior disabled individuals from 28000 to 35000 as permissible by S3085 A and A3956-A -A, real property exemption. So moved. Second. Additional discussion. All those in favor? Oh, wait, sorry, I didn't. I, I moved to amend the motion on the floor. Sorry. Do I then talk? <laughs> um, I just would like um, clarification. <laughs> How, how the amendment is written now, 
um, I, I think we need to specify that we're approving this 50% um, increase. For the current tier. And then also with that 5% scale. Because it's possible actually to do the increase without the scale, I think we need to put the language in that we're, we want to have the scale because we all want to have the but which is what's currently in place I mean, right now. Do we have other right. right. I don't I don't I have that answer. I, I, Jay, do would yeah. we even no. have the authority to change the scale or flat? Um we well sorry, um no, I mean you Right now, the, the scale is set by law as to how that income changes as you drop down from 50 to 45 to 40%. So is, with your resolution only amending what your M is, so you're taking that M from 28,000 to 35,000, your scale will still be set going all the way down to 5%. Thank you, Jay. Okay, great then. I retract so, my motion. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah. Um, all those in favor for the original opposed say motion carry. Thank you. And now we will adjourn uh, to regular meeting. Oh, Thanks. They have, a have a good night, everyone. Let me know if you need anything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion to adjourn to regular meeting. So moved. Thanks. Yeah. All those in favor. Opposed to student motion carried. Thank you. And now we have a few presentations beginning with TST BOCES 2023-2024 budget presentation with Dr. Madsen and uh, Mr. Parsons. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> he said uh, this thing went to sleep. We're going to try not to make you go to sleep. <laughs> Just give you a little bit of information. This this presentation is all for Angie. Oh. We're as fast as we can. <laughs> Just kidding. We're going to give you some. I think there's some important information tonight. And we can share. So thank you for allowing us to come for our annual visit to discuss um, BOCES finances and particularly the administrative budget uh, to help you understand just the way BOCES is financed. Um, we are an extension of our nine school districts. So all of our business uh, is primarily with you. Obviously we do business with outside entities as well and we facilitate business for you with outside BOCES as well. So um, it's a, complicated operation and hopefully we can uh, present it to you in a way that is understandable. Are you ready to go? Yeah, it's just you. Oh. I'm stuck in presenting you. I guess to see this. I'm sorry, I'm saying something. Very good. So um, this is Schumannsburg, some data particular to you folks. Um, the very first number at the top, resident, weighted average daily attendance. That's a state number for your enrollment. It's at least two years old. It's not intended to be perfect um, because it is huge in comparison to all the other districts inside of the BOCES. So that's what the next number is, is in comparison to all the other districts, the other eight, you have 8.31% of the students in the region. That's what that number is for. That number um, is used it's a calculator um, in some BOCES bills when it's in our WADA ratio. You also, because of your enrollment and your wealth, you have an aid ratio. So when they talk about how much BOCES aid do you get? On average, if it's billed on our WADA, 65.6% of what you spend will come back the following year from the state. Could be the following year, some expenses come the same year. We're not going to get into that complication. But that's one way of funding BOCES, and that's a major way of funding it when you have um, large portions of BOCES being billed to you that's equal between districts, such as our administrative budget, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But another way that it's funded is like in CTE, we have a three year average, is how we bill districts 
on their CTE enrollment. And you can see currently you have 56 students in career and tech education at BOCES. Uh, your average is 51, that's what you build on. And your projected for next year is 53.83 is what you will be built on. You may have more students than that, but it kind of levels it out so that the BOCES budget for CTE stays um, flush so we can afford to educate the students. And also you, it protects you from the peaks and valleys of your finances. So that's a second way uh, that we're billing you. Um, a third way is through special education and that is STAC, it's a special funding stream um, that's shared by the state, locals and the federal government. And you can see you have 12.21 students are being billed on. The reason it's a, um, got a decimal is because we build day in, day out. So not all of your students are with us the entire school year. Some are there for a portion of the school year. So they'll be built in a portion. Students in a alternative education programs, 4.678, again, same philosophy, um, day in, day out billing. The difference is special ed is billed, they're stacked, it's a different kind of funding stream for a special education student, alternative ed students will be billed through BOCES aid. So two different funds. So now you've already heard three different ways that you're getting funded through BOCES. So you're understanding the uh, complexity. Students in PTAC, 12, that's purchasing a seat. So there's another way um, that you're being billed at BOCES because that's a different way. And we're grateful uh, for Trumansburg and PTAC because you, um, are the fiscal agent for PTEC. When we got our grant, one of the districts had to agree to be the fiscal agent. It couldn't be a BOCES. It can be nowadays with the new grants, but we're grateful. And it gives John some, something to do because there's nothing else to do <laughs> in the business office on a daily basis. But we appreciate that. And currently, your contract is for five and a half million dollars. So you're purchasing 9.81% of our services, just a little bit more than your percent of BOCES. But the districts that are relatively smaller tend to purchase a little bit more um, than the number of students because they're the ones who need the shares to make sure their students have access to all the same programs as, as a larger school district would be able to provide for themselves, which is kind of the point of the BOCES operation. Any questions about that particular slide? Next slide, I'm not reading to you, and you shouldn't try to read. I just wanted to give you a feel for the number of cooperative services you're doing with BOCES right now. It's about 124 of them. 30 some of them are cross contracts because um, you there's some things that this BOCES doesn't do that another BOCES may and you purchase some services. For example, you may um, like to get the state aid information and Questar 3 BOCES has a great service. The whole state buys from them. So we'll just have here cross contract. Still some paperwork's run through our BOCES. So we're still facilitating that from you. But Probably around 90 of those coasters are particular business operations through your local motions. And each one of those cooperative service numbers has its own little budget. Um, so there's some complications there. We, it's self contained. You can't move money between those cooperative services. So they're in their individualized budgets, unlike a school budget where it's more, but you can't spend more than an X amount. There's some rules for what you've done, equipment, et cetera, which can move around, but you have more flexibility. So um, when we have a contract for a positive service, it's a contract. You have to deliver, and you're going to end up having to stay inside that cooperative service. So just to get a sense of the amount of business you do with your local business. This is the program budget. This is different than the administrative budget. The program budget is all of the things we do for students, back office operations, cross contracts. That's not the administration of the BOCES. Administrative budget, think of as that's what makes BOCES run in the background. Program budget is all the services we offer and districts purchase into it. It's the business of BOCES. And you don't vote on the program budget because you're not going to be able to tell the other eight districts in the BOCES what they can buy. If you're voting up or down, you're basically telling another district you either can do something with this or you can't. So you're not required to vote on the program budget. You basically do, however, because when you vote on your local budget, your voters are voting on that budget and it's voting on the BOCES services you chose to 
um, purchase. So in that sense, the voters got two cracks at our administrative budget and one crack at the program budget because that's built into your local budget. But here you can see for tech education, you, you can see the deltas, what's going up, what's going down. We have explanations for each of those. Um, I won't go too deep into them just to give you a sense of when things go up and down, just so you know how every year our budget is a little different. Like career tech education, we are adding construction trade. So when you add a program, more students, more participation, you have to build a budget for that. Doesn't mean you're paying for it. Whoever is sending kids into construction trade will pay that bill. We also had to add a second teacher into heavy equipment because we had a waiting list and we had space in the program to have more students. We just were going to exceed what one teacher could have. I heard second teacher, plenty of students in there. Um, so we hired a teacher for that program. And we have some additional teaching assistance for some of our other career and tech programs because we had waiting lists in those, but it didn't require us to hire a teacher. They just needed additional assistance. So we had a great year with enrollment for career and tech education. We're anticipating another one. So we need to budget to prepare for the students that just said this. Exceptional education is up 4.77%, which is based on the inflationary costs and the additional students we're getting. One of the things you'll see at the bottom with cross contracts, one of the reasons that's gone down is our neighboring VOCES are saying no to some of the special ed students that our student, our districts used to send because they, they're out of room, they can't find personnel uh, to work with the students. They said, you need to go to your local. They're not accepting anymore of our students. So we've had to add a few more and we're having difficulty keeping up with the demand of special education too. So that's why that's up and the cross contracts are down a little bit. It's tied to the special ed issue. Itinerant, relatively flat, um, instructional services, slight decrease. Some of that is some software programs that have been dropped by some of our districts. So that's why that has gone down. And the PTEC grant, we had to move some from that bill back onto the grant because the grant wasn't allowed to cover capital expenses anymore. So we took it of the program that really was just a shell game it hasn't really changed anything as far as people's what they're actually going to be billed totally for PTEC is just moving things around. Non instructional support 4.4 percent, it's just additional people doing more work with BOSIS. All of these doesn't mean that's your bill going up or down, that's just our business operations. And I'll look first. Any questions on those? Okay, all total. When you add that all up, our total change in our budget is about 6.36%. About half of it is inflationary costs. Half of it is new business coming to VOCES. I talked about some additional programs that are coming and that increases the total cost. That doesn't mean your bill is going up 6.36%. It depends if you're purchasing the services or not. Um, but the total budget, which here is as of initial service request, and that will change when the final service requests come in. So when we bring this initial program budget to you, those numbers will move as people will come into both these services and out of these services as the year goes on. In fact, every year, every month, our board adopts a new budget in both these because the program changes because we have additional people coming into our services a year goes on. Um, Due to the change in the preliminary services, it's an increase about $2.6 million in business. And you can see the ups and the downs that I showed you on the page before. And we facilitate grants of just under $2 million for our districts. Any questions on that slide at all? Hearing none. Thank you. Start with the here. Yep. So the next one we're going to talk about is our administrative budget. The administrative budget is the one that you folks actually vote on. Each of the uh, board members in each of our component districts vote on this one. Um, works very similar to your budget that your, your taxpayers vote on. Uh, there's a maximum amount of the budget. They vote on that and you can't spend a nickel more than that. This one works the same way for the board members to vote on. Same idea. Uh, there's a maximum and it can't go over that. 
Uh, we typically talk about uh, retiree benefits. As you can see, their salaries uh, and equipment, so on and so forth. We've, we've had do some increases in salaries uh, as the contractuals and trying to keep people employed and they don't want to go somewhere else. Uh, but the, the uh, one of the ones that we always talk about is the uh, RAN, uh, the, the, retire, the retiree benefits, which is 841. Um, everyone that retires from TST BOCES that's entitled to health or dental insurance, the cost of that must be put in the administrative budget. So even if you retire from career tech or exceptional ed or maintenance or whatever, that retiree cost of, of the benefit can't be put in the coaster that, that they actually came from. It has to be put in the administrative budget because you guys vote that. So that's one of the things that we always have to do every year uh, is, is make sure that our retiree benefit line has enough in it to cover not only the increase in the people that are in there, but any new ones that are coming in. So we always have to make sure we're looking at that. The big one on this one this year, if you look at the 799 RAM interest, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, it's an $800,000 change. Uh, one of the reasons for that is uh, we're one of the few BOCES that actually borrows our budget. I can give you a little history on that. So years and years and years ago, long before me when the smart people were running things, every district needed to borrow a little bit because you get your tax, pay, uh, ta tax money from the tax collector, tax payers, the, the homeowners, you receive that money in September and October. Most of it you get in September, and then the other half of the people that didn't want to pay it in September pay it in October. And the few that don't pay it in October ends up on the county bill that they end up paying in October, in the, uh, January. And the county actually pays the district, I think it's in November. So you folks have received all of your tax money in September, October, November. But in, in uh, in the end of August, you guys are struggling because you have no, no tax money. You didn't receive any money. So the only money you have is what you've got left over from the previous year to try to operate on. So what would happen is when the BOCES would send out their bill in September, the district said, I don't have enough money to pay that bill. So then the districts would have to go buy and borrow money um, to, to be able to pay that bill. So. I hate when I get my my uh, warranty is run out. Um, <laughs> so what would happen? What ha eventually happened is they all sat down, sat around the table, and said, "Why doesn't BOCES do that instead of each of the nine districts going out and doing a, a borrowing? Which the cost of borrowing is exactly the same. You've got legal fees, you've got bidding costs. It's it's around twenty to twenty five thousand dollars to put out a RAM a rep." Revenue anticip anticipation note. I, I will do that. So instead of each district doing that, they all said, why doesn't BOCES do that? So that's what we've done long before me, probably 30 years our BOCES has done that. So um, fast forward to 2014 when I came, we had budgeted for an interest rate of 4.5%. Well, the economy went south in 2008. And every year since 2008, the cost of our borrowing has been minimal. As in last year was 0.02% is what we, what we borrowed our budget. We paid uh, interest rate on 0.02% of that. This October, they decided that it was time to wake up the interest rates and it went to 4.43. So we have to pay interest on the money that we borrowed. We borrowed about $34.5 million so that the districts don't need to pay us. Um, they don't pay us until May. So what I've done is, um, this is kind of a, a little exercise in cash flow. So what this actually says, and every district down here, so if you go down to Trumansburg, you'll see that the ROI is 983, same number that was on the first page. That represents uh, about uh, a little over 8.3% of the whole BOCES. So if you look at our borrowing costs, and our borrowing cost for this year is $1,030,000. Uh, so Trumansburg's share of that, if you go down there, is $85,000. Oh, let me back up. The eight ratio is the same one that was on the first page also. 
the 60, 65.7% aid ratio. So Bosey's uh, Trumansburg share of the, the 1 point or 1 million 30,000 is 85,000. The Trumansburg share of the legal cost, you can see it's about just shy of 25,000, is $2,000 because those are the costs of borrowing. But because you get aid, if you look at across further, the, the net cost of the interest to Trumansburg is 29,000. The net cost, the legal cost is $698,000 for a total cost for BOCES to borrow the budget of 29,000, $29,800. So that's what it costs Trumansburg for TST to go borrow. If you were to take the money that Trumansburg did not pay BOCES, because BOCES is not going to send the bill until May. So you've received your tax money in September, October, November, all of your tax money that you would have sent the payment to TST BOCES for our yearly costs. We don't send a bill until May. So that money that you didn't send, you can then invest because we aren't gonna send you a bill that you can go put it in CDs. Now, up until recently, CDs paid 0 .0 nothing also, but we were paying nothing in interest either. In this exercise, I plugged in 2.04% to try to figure out what is the interest rate that's needed for each district to offset the cost of their borrowing, the, the cost that we're gonna charge you. How much would you need to, uh, the interest rate to be to take your portion of the borrowing, invest it, and at least break even? So you look on this one at 2.04%, the cost of the borrowing is, 30,000 roughly. At 2.04%, if Trumansburg took their, their share of the RAND, which is 2.874 million, and invested that, you actually could make a, a net cash flow positive of $48,000. Or um, let me go over one more, 18,000, sorry. So at least what you paid BOCES was 30,000 and you invested the money that you didn't pay BOCES to get money, you ended up with a positive cash flow when it's all said and done of $18,999 at 2.04%. In November, we are uh, late October, November, we actually did CDs with the Tompkins Trust Company. Three months were 3.09, uh, six months were 4.04, and 12 months were 4.4%. So let's say you can end up doing the 404, which is 6% or six years, six months. You've collected your money September, October, November. We're not gonna send you a bill until May. So you certainly have got six months that you can take that money and put it aside. If you do the same thing, the cost of the borrowing, if you look at the total, Trumansburg is still 29,884. You take that 2.874 million that we're not that that's your portion of the borrowing and invest it, you end up with a positive cash flow of almost sixty-seven thousand dollars. We we say this because we want that that eight hundred thousand dollar change in this number looks like what are you guys doing? But it actually does make sense when you get all said and done with the financial portion of it that between the A and what you can do when you invest that money, there's actually still a positive cash flow to the district. So we've had this conversation with the business officials because we want to make, make sure that everybody understands does it still make sense. We try to analyze this every year or two. We talked with the superintendents to make sure that they also knew does this still make sense. We want people to see it and say, yep, that still makes sense or nope, stop it. Um, like I say, at 4.04%, every district had a, had a pretty good sized net gain in their cash flow. So we, we tell this to you because when we're coming out with a 27.33% increase in the budget, that, that really is one that people are saying, you guys do it, but that's not doable. That's not, that doesn't make sense. But it does make sense when you can end up with a positive cash flow, even with a 27% increase in that budget. Because our normal increase is down in the normal three, three percent. 
if we took that out of this, but with that borrowing, it, it changes it. One of the things uh, when I was on the, on the school board, we talked, uh, SED wanted us to stop borrowing our budget. They said, you can't do that. You're getting aid on that. We did a whole bunch of research and sent letters back to SED and said, where in your regs does it say we can't do that? And they couldn't, they couldn't do it. But they did say that any BOCES that stops doing this, you cannot start it again. So just something other else to keep in mind when we're when we're coming out with that budget, because that's the one you guys will vote on. Any questions with that? Because I know that's a lot of data and a lot of explanation, and I'm sure I got twisted around the axle with some of the, the process, but we want you guys to understand what what that is and if you feel comfortable with that, then we then we'll continue to do it. Any questions? Okay. That's good. It was thorough. Well, it, it the people long before me are the ones that figured it out. It makes sense. So, anyway, so that is the budget that we're actually going to bring out to you folks. Um, we just don't want people to have a heart attack when they see that. It's hard. It's hard to understand how you can have that kind of increase and save, and you're making money off of it. It's, yeah. that, it's that issue of the, the interest rates changed for borrowing yeah. and also for investing. Right. So just to reiterate, Dave has done a great job of educating all of our regional business officials, myself included, on the investment process. We've already started to lay the groundwork for next year to do that. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. what happens is what well, the cost of borrowing and the cost of or the cost of borrowing, which is always a little bit more than the, than the interest you could make, is all it, it moves together. It never does this. They move together. They walk down together. And as long as we're generating the aid, you're always going to be ahead of it. No matter as long unless it gets way out of whack, but they don't. They'll stay within a few points of each other. When it was 0.02% is what we were paying for, for uh, interest last year. I think if you had money in the savings account, which CDs were useless to do, it was more work than it was worth. But in a savings account, you were getting 0.01 maybe or 02, but it was still by the time you got all said and done, it made it made sense. Our savings, I think, right now is at that two two percent. Uh, so what we've always actually done at TST is all of our reserves and everything else are now in CDs at 12 months. So we took advantage of the the, the, the spot that we could get it. So as long as there's not any questions with that one, we'll move on. So the last thing is uh, there has to be a vote that you folks will vote on uh, two things. Uh, one is our administrative budget and board members that will be on the TST BOCES board. Uh, this year, Ithaca, South Seneca, and Trumanford uh, representatives are up for uh, election or re-election. Uh, and like I say, you'll vote on that administrative budget. And that happens on Wednesday, April 26th this year. Any questions? All right, we will go from there. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, I just wanna remind the trustees that if you do have questions for Jeff or Dave, tonight is a night to ask them. I do actually have a question. Sure. Going back to the, the very first slide about P Tech students, and we have 12 in our district, is that, um, a cap number at 12, and are all the schools about 12? Because it's all over the map. In fact, we just had Newfield just came on board with a student. They hadn't participated up till now. So it's, it has its ups and downs. And how much does that, if you like, how much does that cost per student, and how much of it is aidable for the district? All of the, all of the, um, cooperative service portion of PTEC, which is maybe about twelve thousand dollars, is what it is right now, is aidable just like a CTE program. You know, it's aided the same way. So there's a cooperative service. The state's giving us grant money. That's for free money that we can use for a portion of PTEC that was growing, 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 and then it's going to gradually release. And that's why we've slowly raised the tuition costs. 
so that it becomes a sustainable program. You wouldn't want students to get in there and all of a sudden the cutoff of where the program is, is at. So that's about what it is, which is, uh, I would say it's going to end up being about 75% of the CTE cost in the end. So if we have 12 students in our district currently in that program, and it's already been now long enough that they're in all four grades, um, is it uncommon for a district our size to have send more than three students to that program, or is there really a cap or no cap at all? There's no cap at all. Send as many as you want. We have a cap on, we could probably squeeze up the between 25 and 30 in a class that was built on one class, a ninth grade would be 25 to 30 students, 10th grade, 25 to 30, et cetera. That would be the cap. Like when the total class hit their mark, we'd have to say we can't take any more students. Because as soon as you do that, now you your cost not may not double, but it goes astronomical. But you gotta buy additional staff, et cetera. Right. And we have a spacious, we have a great space over at TC3, but it's enough for that school to like a hundred total students. And how does it continue on years five and six for the students that continue? How does that get paid? There is additional aid for that. What's interesting is when the grants were first out, the aid was, of course, six years. But then when they projected out, every time they extended out to 10 years. So there will be aid to help offset that tuition. It's supposed to be a tuition free associate's degree for an additional two years when the students exit the high school portion of the program. So they actually become college students at that point. And we had 10 out of our first 17. It was a small first class, and we had a very high percentage stay at PC3. 10 of them stayed on. Um, we had the aid to help offset that. And is there data uh, available of how many of those students continued then to a four-year degree transfer? We haven't had anybody there long enough. Some freshmen in PC3 right now, so we don't know what persistence rates are going Great question, though. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good to see you all. Have a great night. All right. <laughs> so next we have. <laughs> you going next? I'm next. All right. Uh, next, we have John King with 2023-2024 uh, non-instructional budget information. Can it be quicker? How many slides you got, Tom? <laughs> Twenty. Four. That's Pam. Three, four. <laughs> Slide maximum. <laughs> All right. Uh, my my presentation will be very quick tonight. Uh, I do just have three primary slides <laughs> and, primary. And, a, and a fourth bonus slide, um, just for just for Jeannie. Um, oh, what are you doing with Kimberly over there, John? <laughs> Showing this Zoom window tango. Put in time out or something. Oh, there we go. Uh, okay, so tonight's tonight's presentation is really just the non-instructional areas of our budget. Um, I wanted to just give folks a ballpark. Of this we're going to cover benefits, um, operations and maintenance, and our information technology and library budgets tonight. Uh, so the benefit estimates. Again, I presented some of this information in, my, in our last board meeting. Uh, I've refined some of those numbers. Um, the, the specifically the health insurance number, I did a deeper dive into that uh, to make sure that I was making it uh, with an appropriate margin, but not over, not over inflating. Um, so you'll see the increase there. I reduced the increase in health insurance down to sixty thousand. Um, that reflects just some. Uh, there's a set right now we're budgeting based on a seven point five percent increase over the per plan cost, but looking at the exact number of plans that we have, the existing staff that we have, and all of our bargaining units, um, I've been able to tighten that margin up a little bit and still leave enough for if when we hire or fill new positions, we will have enough to cover all of any potential plans. Um, 
The numbers that uh, you'll see lower going down workers comp, you'll see that dropping. That is because uh, we're part of a consortium and they are dropping our rates because that organization has a very healthy reserve uh, from the last few years. So they, they have set our rates quite a bit lower for next year. You'll see right now, this year we're 114, next year they're projecting us at 72,000. So that's a nice savings for the district. Um, and then the only other line on here that I really wanted to hit on was the uh, dental insurance because we just don't have, again, that one I'm, I'm estimating based on what our consortium um, from uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield had estimated, but we, we have not received our actual rates yet. So that is a, an estimate based on what we've seen in terms of other rate increases. So that could change uh, in the coming weeks. Any question on those benefits? Most of the, they're mostly formulas. Uh, ERS, TRS is based on formulas. ERS is, uh, we have a percentage. Last year it was 10 and a half percent. Right now, I think we're just shy of 11%. Um, so they're, they're all, they're, they're formula driven. Estimates at this point. Uh, next, our operations and maintenance. Uh, again, salary line is, is contractual. It's all, it's just a formula. Um, when you look at our projected expenses for this year, you'll see they're coming in lower than anticipated. That's because we've had positions that have stayed unfilled off and on throughout the year. So uh, we have to budget based on the assumption that we'll actually fill all the positions we want to have. Um, so so the, the increases still go up. Uh, equipment, you'll see the, there's a, a fluctuation because of that huge, the large purchase of the lawn mowing equipment. Uh, we had that transfer from reserves that went into that budget line. So I wanted to reflect it in this presentation, but you'll see that our estimate for next year is back to a more standard estimate for the equipment line for O&M. Uh, contractual lines, just standard increases, materials and supplies, standard increases. The BOCES services, again, you heard the gentleman earlier speaking about initial service requests. We have not gotten our final budget numbers with our final service requests from BOCES. So again, that's based on an estimated increase uh, in the probably over the course of this month, I will finalize our final service requests. I've got meetings with some of the admin team and then Kimberly and I will close that up, that process up as soon as she returns and uh, sign off on our final service request, which will allow me to really do a much finer grain analysis of our BOCES budget lines across the board, not just in this area. And then finally, information technology and library budget. Again, we are looking at rolling forward pretty much standard. You know, the increases that you're seeing are contractual increases to salaries. Uh, the equipment line is going to stay fairly consistent. That is, again, it's based on state aid, uh, a state aid line. Uh, contractual expenses we're keeping relatively consistent. Uh, Josh does a great job of maintaining his budget and monitoring it precisely what we need. Uh, again, as we work with our admin team, there's a couple of variables that we're still debating on whether or not we want to invest in certain software programs. Um, so that could change a little bit in the coming weeks, um, but this is looking at rolling things forward and keeping things fairly consistent and same with materials and supplies. The BOCES line, same issue until we get our final service requests. And that is a the, the IT line for, for BOCES services is a very substantial line. We do pay for a lot of services through the RIC. Um, so that, that's a line that um, I'm very curious to see how it plays out in the next few weeks. So total increases for that area, 53,000. And if there aren't any other questions, I'll finish with one picture of kids because I know my slideshows are boring, so I wanted to make sure that I put in pictures of kids because that's why we do all of this stuff. So, aren't they adorable? Just for you, Jeannie. There you go. All right. Without any, any questions about the little bit that I presented on the Nicely done. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Pam Rakosa and Angie Gimiani uh, with District Data. There we go. Oh, no. You broke it. 
entire data yet? Sorry. Not at all. Do you have a few pictures of kids in your slideshow? No. I told you. Uh, Ms. Connelly, I'm sorry. Yeah. And before you start, um, Ms. Connelly, can we turn up the heat a little bit in this room? It's so cold in here. Even our guests are, are bottled up. Water Is it possible? Tell them bring an electric blanket. <laughs> has the power to do that. Uh, it's on an automated system. It's a computer situation. So, <laughs> mm, so yeah, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> you're asking the wrong person. Don't look at me. Um, <laughs> you won't be offended if I put on my coat. It's for good. We're, okay? we're saving yeah. electricity. Just put on your coat. Right. Utilities have actually increased. We're saving money. Yeah. Clean something. Just my mother would say. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. Huh? Yeah. There we go. So illustrated beautifully by Dave, data doesn't always tell us the whole story, right? We have to have some explanation. So I just wanted to kind of preface by starting with that. Um, this data is, it's rocky and it's rocky because of the pandemic. Um, the state themselves have said, don't compare it to old data because it doesn't match. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there and. Um, let you know that we look at our students as people, not as numbers. So we want to make sure that you keep that in mind too. The state issued this um, statement due to the ongoing impacts of COVID, it may not be appropriate to compare 21-22 results from results to prior years. So we're not going to do that. We're going to look at results from this year compared to other kids that took the same test this year. <laughs> and that's how we're going to measure where we're at. Okay. Um, we don't want to compare apples and oranges. This, um, the state tests have changed so much over the past few years. Uh, prior to COVID, there was changes uh, based on the standards, then COVID, then there wasn't a test at all. Then the, the year after that, we had a two-part test instead of a three-part test. Now the test is shorter. And this year, um, students will be getting an entirely different test based on new standards again. So it's really tough to compare test to test. Um, so going forward, you're saying even next year's data won't be comparable with this year, even right. though we're post-COVID because there's more variables again. Right, right. So it's just like it's a fruit basket upset all, all the time. So here's what's happening. Uh, new assessments are going to be happening over the next couple of years. So this year, we're getting a new 3 through 8 ELA and math assessment aligned with the new standards. Um, the science five and eight is also going to be new next year. So this year, our fifth graders are not taking the science assessment because they took it in fourth grade. So there's a, a skip year. And next year, the fourth graders that will be fifth graders will be taking the first fifth grade assessment. So if, does that make sense to everybody? So yeah, so this will be the last year for eighth grade to take that science assessment. Next year, it will be different. They're working towards moving the regions to different assessments. So everything's changing all the time, <laughs> okay? Um, some other points to kind of consider when you're looking at this information is that this is sort of a random sample because we, have, we do not have everybody taking the assessment. So in the past, prior to COVID, the state would require us to have 95% of our population test in order for us to be compliant as a district. Now with students opting out of tests, we don't have that many students taking it. We don't have, uh, in some cases, less than 95%. So it makes it a little harder to validate the test when not so many kids are taking it. So that is a very variable also. Um, this school year, is, like I said, our tests will be aligned with the next gen. And then there, there were some regents cancellations and this spring, no science five. So there's some discrepancies there <laughs> between district testing and building testing. And so um, I just wanted to kind of, and I'll make that a little clearer as we go along. Um, district scores include all of our students that are placed in all other settings. Building scores include just the kids that are in our building all day, experiencing our curriculum. That's the difference between those two scores, okay? So I kind of housed this by our board goals. I wanted you to see that 
we, we look at our board goals. We do have um, actionable steps that we're taking towards those goals. So in, in, case, in, the, in the case of board goal one, we're giving the panorama assessments and that helps us with the SEL information, which you'll hear about in a little bit. Um, we added a program called Naviance and maybe Megan could maybe mention what that is. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. So it's a program uh, that we purchased for this year. It's a career and college uh, web-based program for our students and families to have access to. Uh, so it's actually an opportunity for middle school students and high school. Uh, so not only are we providing this opportunity in terms of college and career searching, but down the road, it also is an opportunity for us to link uh, students up with resumes, um, the interest inventory uh, are available for students and families, as I mentioned, and then also it helps our um, students with their college application process. So that is something we're just starting to roll out with students this year. Great. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at multiple pathway opportunities, like how can we give kids different opportunities within our curriculum, within our programming? The seal of civic readiness is a new thing that's happening. We're really preparing for that. We're really hoping to get some kids through that. And we're actually, the social studies department's been working very hard to build it into our curriculum so that all students will be able to earn that seal just by going to class. They'll be, they'll be, it'll be embedded in their class. That's what we're really hoping for. Um, academic support in the high school learning center. And then the summative data analysis, that is something that we're, we're really looking at right now. Let's look at the data and we're gonna talk about what changes need to be made to the curriculum, to instruction, and to our programming. We're always developing curriculum and looking at it and changing it and looking at what professional learning do we need in order to do better. So those are some of the things that we're doing to help us reach board goal one. So you can see here, like I said before, Charles O. Dickerson High School um, graduation rate, Trumansburg High School graduation rate, and then the New York State average, okay? So the, the district score includes everybody that's in all placements, okay? And the building score includes just the kids in our building. The okay. district score would include our highly special ed students that we have put Sposi and PTAC, right? Mm -hmm. Regional alternative school. Yeah. Yep. Good. Yes. So our regents exams from last year. And I'll just, I wanted to just highlight really quickly you can see our overall proficiency percentage, though that's the percent of students that are proficient, and then the state average of proficiency. You can see we're above the state average in all areas, which is amazing. Um, and then it's broken down by, to show you like, you know, how many students got which scores. So you can kind of take a look at that too. So, Participation in the three through eight, I just wanted to point this out to you. Um, this year, we had more participation than last year, which is great. With the exception of grade eight, they participated a little bit less, um, but we're working back up towards having more participation in the assessments. The more kids that take the test, the easier it is for us to validate it and to like get some information from it. What is out of you know, if, if there's 72% in the eighth grade who are taking these tests, what is the profile of that group that is opting out? And that's part of the problem. We don't know. We, we like It's a random sample of who's actually taking it and who's not taking it. Because because we're not deciding, parents are deciding they want to opt out. So we don't know. But, but you know the students who right. clearly didn't okay. take it. So do you know that these are typically kids that, that perform well in school or ones that are struggling? In I think it's a mix. I think it's a mix. I mean, I didn't like go through the list of all the kids that opted out. I would love to, to hear about the opt out. And yeah. The, yeah. So I, what I would say over um, the past few years in terms of students opting out, and I could probably, it certainly wouldn't be appropriate, but in my head, I can see every single student's face and I know that list. 
um, a variety of reasons um, in which students and families made the choice to have them opt out. So we have some students that might have been even accelerated and the families didn't feel like that best aligned with their family's uh, thoughts and values. We had some students that school has been really difficult for them and the families made decision for them to opt out. So a wide range of abilities and reasons and for which families made that choice. It doesn't mean that we're not encouraging and, and recognizing the importance of this data, uh, but you know, per New York State, like we, we did have to honor those requests. So again, especially if you look at the last couple of years and you know, identifying our eighth grade group, in which I know that group uh, quite well, their current uh, ninth grade students, uh, their, their experience over the last couple of years has been quite challenging, like all students. But when we closed down school in the spring, of their sixth grade year, and they came back uh, twice a week when they were seventh grade students. And so making the decision for families whether they wanted to um, find their pathway through, they were here two days a week, and then approaching the, the testing. So again, we honored those requests, but in terms of classifying a group of students who opted out, as Pam said, we had a wide range of what that looked like for students. So if it was a very diverse school spectrum, yeah, then our numbers test score sh should be relatively a fair assessment if those who opted out. If, yes. Yeah. 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 It just makes it harder that small it's, sample too, right. you know, because we're already a small district, you take out 25% of that. Just statistically, those numbers become like that. And what do, I see what you're saying that it could be fairly representative. Yeah. And what do these students then do on the day or days mm -hmm. that their peers are taking the test? Is it the polls? <laughs> In the elementary school, they go to the library and there's just some quiet library time until students are done and then they return to their class. Or some families will keep them home. So um, I can speak to my previous hat at the middle school um, for students that were opting out and they did come to school during the time that the testing took place. The students were in a separate area and they were asked to read and that time they didn't have access to technology. So they're reading or if they had academic work, they could do that. Not fun, but not a bunch. Right. <laughs> I'm, honest, I'm not saying reading not fun, but you know what I mean? You don't want it to be enticing for kids, but you also don't want it. I don't think that any kid who was taking a test was like, yeah, I'm going to go take the test <laughs> while the others are, are having quiet reading in the library. John, what happened in high school? Do you know? like what? There is no opting no. out of okay, reading. No. You, you can't opt out. Well, okay. uh, not a you can't just don't get a read just a poem <laughs> right. right. And you'll notice that for some of them, the, there are fewer, the percentage is a little bit smaller for math because the ELA test comes first. <laughs> And so sometimes kids will take the ELA test and find that they're very anxious about it and their families will then pull up from the back. Yeah, I mean, it's a hard sell for families because it's not an intrinsically, right. it doesn't do anything for kids or families right. Right. to inform the districts. So that's right. a harder sell. Is, yeah. Do you find that this is, is this a snapshot you think or do you think this is a progression of, the, of what's gonna happen as, as more people, I mean, no, opting I, out was used to be my percentages like, of taking the test in third and fourth are, are very high um several years ago they were kind of matching where the eighth grade is now so i feel like it's kind of moved through i don't know if it will you know kind of check that but right now we're at very high percentage I'm, I'm curious to understand can the school can the district ever completely opt out of doing these tests like as a district can we opt out of that no um, and like I said before, um, prior to COVID, we had to have a 95% participation rate to be compliant with the state. Then they put you on, on the naughty list if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. So they took that away during COVID because they knew that it was a struggle for everybody. And they haven't really mentioned about putting that back into place, but that has been the past practice for that. Yeah, the reason why I ask is because I know we made a big shift in the middle school to kind of move away from mm -hmm. kind of grading and testing being biased and, and some mm -hmm. of those challenges and this is just something that we're requiring people to do that doesn't align with that new way that I think we're moving. Well it does align with the standards. Mm -hmm. I mean it's still the standards, it's still the same uh, information that we're seeing if students learn. Um, so it's the same information. Uh, it just might not 
feel the same as an assessment, it might not feel the same, but. Yeah, as a standardized test, not all kids take tests well. Right, right. right. And so we're looking at one snapshot versus the body. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Um, Josh, can you move that cat? There, where's, <laughs> she needs to come in, okay. Um, so this is the ELA three through eight scores. So what I did was I put together the state averages, the TST BOCES regional average, and the T-BIRD average, okay? So you can see that we're orange. Um, we are often right with the state and region or above. Um, yeah. So this was just 22 last, last spring. And then in turn, I wanted to share these with you because I think they're good. I know you can't really read them, but you just look at them. These are the regional BOCES averages, all the districts in our region. And you can see where we are. I've kind of put the arrow where we are, okay? So for third grade there, you can see the black line and there's a blue line. Blue, I think is TST BOCES and the black is the New York State line, okay? So like for third grade, we're above both of those lines. Fourth grade, we're above both of those lines. But more importantly, you can see where we fall within the region. Okay. So that's third and fourth, fifth and sixth. And this is just ELA. And seven and eight. Can you go back to that last? the slide before. Mm -hmm. So if this we're one. below the state level on these. This is participation though, not how the no, kids no, this is, no, this is their academic performance. Oh, sorry. The 94% is the persistent. Sorry. I yes. looked at that participation. I added the participation so you could know how many kids we're talking about. Okay. Okay. So like you can see for sixth grade, eight, only 84% of our sixth graders took the test. 94% of our fifth graders took the test. So it does impact a little bit. So what's Jim? What are you? So is does this translate into unlearned material? No. Or bad test taking, or like because on those be. other on those other slides we are exceeding state levels, but these two cohorts are 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 below. So it it really depends, and so that's where the summative assessment uh, is is really important for us to look at that data and figure out. Sometimes it is unlearned but sometimes it's a bad question. Sometimes it's, there's lots of reasons. It but the bad be. question's the same bad question for New York State. True, yes. But so for example, sometimes with the um, assessment bills, they'll, they'll, there might be a question about um, going on the subway. Well, our kids don't have a subway. Some of them might not even know what a subway is. So that impacts us differently than it might impact the kids in the city, right? So that's what I mean about the questions. Sometimes the, the academic language or there's just exposure things that they might not know. And I'm not trying to make excuses. I'm just saying there's lots of variables that it could be. But part of what I like about this chart is you can see that even though we're a little below the state there, we're still above the rest of the region. Like there's still schools that are doing you know, less than we are. So I just, that's why I put these um, in there because I think it's really important to see where we are in the context of the whole region in our area. So not in compared to students in the city, in, you know, in New York or in Rochester even. And, and not for nothing, like I know that eighth grade doesn't look great, right? So that's where we look, we pull the data out, we see what it looks like, we see where what, where our kids are not doing well, we see, but again, 72% participation rates. So that's not everybody. Took How many kids were in the, in the um, That's a good game. 60. 60. This is, so, this is this year's freshman class? Yeah. Yes. And so do you mind hopping back to the previous slide? That, this one? So Groton, Groton is very, consistently high scores mm -hmm. here and in Tiber Duel, but then it's just that 
they they stay consistent. And then if we go back, Hebert does take that dip in, in this year's freshman. I also am curious about using the state as a baseline or as a as a goal because fifty percent at these that are meeting standards fairly low when mm -hmm. you have a school with this. So that that doesn't seem like it's in line with the spirit. I'm sure I, I'm sure that state testing isn't addressed in that um, board goal, but in line with the spirit of of that um, goal that we should be even. We should be beyond looking beyond fifty percent. That, that's 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 quite low. Yeah, I mean, none of these numbers feel good, but when we look at the state averages, it helps us understand where everybody's at, so that we can see. Because if you know, like obviously, eighth grade is is very low. So that's something we have to really look and dig into the data and look at it and look at the assessment and see what what happened there. Yeah, Jane, would you Jane. like to say something? Yeah. Oh, can you? Yeah, hello. Let me see if I can start my video here. Um, hi, everyone. Can you see me? Yes, yes, thank you. Oh, gosh, I'm up on that big screen. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so I just want to speak uh, for one second about the scores of Grot that Jim had mentioned because I was there last year. Um, and for the last several years, Groton's test scores have been in the single digits for proficiency in ELA and math across middle school. And what we started doing over there is what you know Pam has been working on here is taking a good solid look at the state standards and the alignment of our assessments to those standards and making sure that teachers are aware in formative assessments whether or not their students are reaching proficiency and when they're not reaching proficiency intervening. And so between um, 20, 2019 and 2022, Groton saw double their proficiency rates in those exams. And so one of the things that we're working to do is kind of the same work here at the middle school. We sat down with the ELA and math teachers a couple of weeks ago, started going through the test data and looking to see if our curriculum is in fact in line with the rates at which the standards are being tested on the exams. And so we're tearing into that work now and then looking to see if we can align it to the next gen standards that are rolling out this spring and into the future. So it just gives you a little glimpse into how quickly that that data, especially when you're in a small school district like Groton in here, can improve because a few school, a few students doing better um, collectively over a grade level really makes the numbers jump up. We did other interventions. I mean, we, you know, I don't think we're wholly surprised by this data, right? Like she was saying, yeah, some of those grades were trending low. So we added the additional RTI teacher at the middle school. I know you guys have been revamping um, how labs are worked or those you know, remediation periods. Like there's a lot of that kind of back work, you know, in the special ed and I think in RTI world too, you can never get more time for kids, right? The kids that need it, you're never gonna get a longer day. So you're taking that time and looking at what can we do differently in those seven hours, right? What, how can they get more direct teacher time? How can they get a smaller class size? How can we roll in basic skills and business? So all of those are, you know, the conversations that we continue to have. Is this this year's freshman class, how, how are they doing in, in ELA, in, in English? I mean, this is, are they struggling with, with high school level work? Because this looks terrible on paper. So again, going back to opening slide, uh, the first two slides with Pam, and if I'm going to report out how students are doing after the first three marking periods and trying to compare that to you know, a percentage of students that performed on a state exam the year prior, really difficult to compare in terms of how successful they are. So we do go back and look at how they're doing in each marking period. We put interventions in place. So that's what we're doing right now. So we're doing that every six weeks for sure. Uh, we're certainly seeing a much higher success rate with our ninth grade cohort than in comparison to the, the numbers here. But again, I think we have to be really careful about analyzing one slice of the pie right now. And, and this is There's, just one test. This is just one. Yeah, one test. There's a lot more that we're talking about and you know I think that we also have to reflect on our goals here beyond looking at our core goals but also our application for our students and be able to to think beyond the test is really important and looking at our values as a school community so 
I would love to be able to give you a precise percentage right now and say this is how our students are doing, but I don't think that's accurate or fair in that context. And also, when there's 28% of that cohort who did not test, right. that if they would have all taken a test, I'm sure we would have well, been like much higher. Students. Let me let me show you the map. I think. Hmm. So math, similarly, I want to show you what eighth grade says, okay? 90% proficiency, eek, right? But that is not all of our eighth graders. A portion of our eighth graders take the Regents exam in eighth grade. So I put the Regents scores right next to that. So you can see all of our eighth graders that took the Regents passed, 100% of them. When I combine all the eighth graders that took the Regents and all the eighth graders that took the eighth grade math assessment, we get the combined eight score. And you can see that that's more in line with what is happening around the state. And I put the 2021 on there just to show you that it's pretty consistent. Um, but that's a good example of why we try not to take all the data by, you know, just by what it looks like. because. We can't, we can't compare to the region with the combined eight because we don't know what other schools are doing as far as the, the regions versus the grade eight math. Um, that can happen in different ways at different schools. Here, our students take one or the other. In some districts, they have to take the eighth grade. They all have to, even if they take the regions. So it just depends on the district. So it's really hard to know where those other scores fall. But they pass, but a passing on the regions is a 66, correct? Mm -hmm. So that's different than, it, wouldn't that be different than a three on the state test in terms of mastery? Yeah, is a 65, so proficiency is an 85 on a regions exam. Okay, so in this, is it 100% for an 85? Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So again, like, I, that's just, a reminder that the you know those numbers sometimes don't tell the whole story. Um, these are the regional comparisons again with math. So that's grade three, four, five, and six, and then seven, and then again eight. But that number does not reflect everybody. Okay. 51% did not participate. Correct. And that's interesting. I think it was state. mentioned that the um, participation for the the math test goes down because of anxiety from the earlier test. Is that right? That's that's just, more in third and fourth, I think, um, when they're just learning about taking the test. I don't know that it at this level maybe hurt you. Some of this is about take some take the algebra. We didn't take this. Okay, so that's part of that too. Because if, if participation is going down at some level due to anxiety, it might be that this is actually a lower value than reality. Stacy, I think also if, if like no, sorry, a higher value than reality because you're you're taking out people that are anxious. And if you assume anxious people would score worse, I mean, it's all a lot of ifs. Yeah. But you could easily say that this is actually higher than what you might expect otherwise. I mean, you could say, but there's, there's so many reasons I that I wouldn't would, put any yeah. specific yeah. value on what it would look like. Or, we, or perhaps you have some students that even though they might struggle academically or emotionally, but they might not have um, a family member that realizes that they can advocate for them. So mm -hmm. there's... It's, so it's really hard to, yeah. to represent that. I, and I and correct me if I'm wrong, Pam, this 49%, there's about 25% of the cohort that is taking algebra. Yeah. And those algebra kids do not take this test. Correct. Correct. So when we're taking then these, these relatively um, higher achieving math students out of that test Correct. score, that that totally explains yep. that, that which difference. is why I did the combined eight score okay so that you could see that was everybody together okay in proficiency just proficiency okay 
that's why I put them together, Jim, because it does, it's it's very deceiving. Okay. So science. Wait, can I, just one more question. What was the number that the N value for that eighth grade math? Uh, number of students? Oh, that's 68. So I already had that in the top of my head. 33 kids. Well, well, 30, because you got to take out the kids who didn't exactly. do that. So out of the 68, say 20 of them took the other, then it's even more. And then you have 25 kids in algebra. 22 kids right. probably in that class. How many kids made, made up the algebra divisions? I don't have their numbers of students. I mean, there's not Megan's going to pull it up. 67 right there. But I'm sure if we would have added the algebra kids in it, it would be like probably 72% for distribution rate right, if they. Right. Yeah. I just, I wanted to highlight that particular score, what it's showing you. So, um, because the regional uh, reports don't include combined eight because every district does it differently. So some of the algebra kids might be, you know, we, we don't wanna include them in there and compare it to the other regional schools when we don't know what they're doing. You find it? Okay, she's getting there. <laughs> in the meantime, here's our science, uh, grades four and eight. Again, we're above the state average of proficiency and the same situation as math. Some take the regents and some take the eighth grade. So I, the combined eight is below there in yellow. Okay, so that's both the regents kids and the eighth grade students that took science. So those are our proficiency scores in science underneath. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, this is meant, wasn't meant to be so long, but I wanted to make sure that I addressed all the things that we are doing to achieve these goals. And I know Stacy had asked about strategies. And so I wanted to make sure that I listed a bunch of things that we are doing. Um, what we've just been looking at is summative data. And, and it's summative because it's at the end of something, right? And it doesn't really help us intervene with kids because they're done. They're done with eighth grade. So there's nothing we can do to help them with eighth grade material at that point. But what we can do is look at the data and make adjustments to our curriculum, to our instruction. Where are we missing things? What is What standards are we missing? That's what we do when we evaluate. But the real work for students is evaluating formative data, which is what's happening during the course of the school year. So we have, for example, at K-8, we do an iReady diagnostic assessment three times a year. We look at that data, we make adjustments, we also intervene for students and provide, um, also for students that are doing well, provide them some acceleration if, they can, if, they, if we can. So it's that data that really makes a difference and we're really looking to create processes that make that easier for teachers so that we can have access to real-time data all the time. Um, I like this, this visual because it, it's a good reminder that formative assessment is when the, the chef tastes the soup and makes adjustments, right? The summative stuff is when we, the guest gets it and it's too late. If it doesn't taste good, it doesn't taste good, right? So we're trying to be proactive with our data and make adjustments before we get to the summative stuff. Did you find that? Sorry, I was having a hard time with school. <laughs> That's okay. I can pull the average. Okay. So this is just an example of what some of the formative assessment might look like. So this is iReady reading for the entire building at the middle school and the high or in the elementary school. And this is comparing the winter diagnostic to the fall and it shows growth for us. And that's what we're really looking for. The good thing about iReady is we can get this big overview picture, but we can also drill all the way right down to one student and see what are their gaps? What are the skills that they need to work on and where are they at? So that gives us lots of real-time information on students all throughout the school year so that we can keep making adjustments and interventions. If I can just add the bar is raised every time we have a benchmark. Yeah. We're not shooting for the same thing every time. So to have more people reach the bar is, is really great. Yeah, the bar moves. 
for sure. So reading proficiency, K4, I know that that was another question that came to me about uh, that grade three. We, we wanna to try to get everybody reading at grade level by grade three. So you can see on this chart, we have our fall score on there, but I don't have our winter reading scores because our teachers are still giving that assessment. So the f &P assessment is lengthy, it's individual, um, and so it takes a long time and they just aren't done with it yet. So I can't give you that number, but if you look across the top fall scores, you can see the improvement that we're making. Um, in that vein, in the other vein, we've been doing a lot of letters, professional learning around the science of reading. And we just had a conversation today with um, some of our primary teachers about that assessment and is it really in line with the science of reading? And so we're looking for other ways to measure reading proficiency for students. And so that's another thing that we're trying to do and put in place is to find other ways to measure proficiency rather than this F and P assessment. So that's in the works as well. Did you want to say anything else about reading? No, I'm just excited um, with the conversation Pam was talking about. Um, we, you know, teachers by their nature work really hard and do the absolute best for their students. And so when we're talking about changing, it's, a, it's difficult because we have to kind of let go of what we were doing, which was in our minds the best thing. So I am just so proud of the staff that we are having these conversations and talking together and coming up with um, what we think is best according to the science of reading. So I'm really excited to see where, where we can go. And that I think is directly related to our professional learning that we've been doing with letters for the past few years now. Unfortunately for us, COVID kind of threw a monkey wrench in there. And so um, we, we had to contend with some of that uh, learning loss, but you can see we're quickly catching up. So between that and our summer reading program, um, our, some, our after school program is starting this week, I think. Um, finally, we were able to get some tutors to help after school. So we've got a lot of irons and a lot of fires. Um, I'm not gonna read this whole list, but again, another piece of action planning that is all the things that we are doing um, in response to the data. And you can take a look at that. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Angie. Board goal three and four kind of walk together in um, DEI support and SEL support. And Angie's gonna give you some of the panorama data from that screen. So, uh, thanks, Sam. <laughs> like Megan said, you know, when we are looking at data, academics is just one piece of the puzzle, right? We're trying to raise to build kids who are strong with their social emotional skills, uh, interactions with others, self worth, ability to work in groups. All of those are really important things. So, I came last year and talked to you about some of you sat in a committee that talked in depth about this social emotional screener that we started. So this is a universal screener, similar to what we do for reading and math with iReady. Universal meaning that it's given to everyone, right? That it's also sensitive to change, that we can look at change in a student and a cohort over time. We started in the winter of last year and um, we had started in winter, we started with grades three through 12. Uh, and then we did that winter and spring, and then this fall we added in K2. So third through 12th grade is a self-report. Students um, self-report on a Likert scale, and there's also some free response to questions. Uh, K2, the teachers fill that out for their students. Uh, we did that fairly late in the fall uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, we do a lot of initial assessments. We didn't want that fatigue of assessments for kids. Too, especially for K2, you know, giving teachers time to get to know their kids before they're rating their kids. Um, we had done a social emotional screener before. We did, let's see, that was 2022. In 2021, um, that we really didn't like. We didn't think we were getting good data for that. It was cumbersome for students to take it. 
Um, this one we have found, I put down there, one of the pros is the ease of execution. It's a really quick, easy survey for kids. Our kids don't mind taking it. Doesn't take up a lot of class time. At the high school, we have the PE teachers take 15 minutes out of a PE class because everybody takes PE. Um, do the quick survey. Um, kids aren't complaining about it. My own kids don't complain, complain about it. They complain about a lot of things. So they usually take that as a good thing. Um, the other thing we like is we could self-select the areas. So we've chose to keep those stable for these three rounds of assessment. We may eventually want to change those. We couldn't choose the questions because they're nationally normed because part of the data we want is how our kids compared to other students but we could choose the area. So I put those up there in red. Um, part of the reasons we chose these areas were one, we had questions about them, right? We wanted to see where our kids were. Two, um, every year they come and report on the Clyde survey that's given at the high school. So it was maybe some areas that were lower in the Clyde survey and we wanted a little more um, information on that. Um, I can say one of the cons and Josh will certainly back me up on this. Um, there has been some, <laughs> some difficulty on the technical side with data viewing. Part of that was uploading our rosters. Part of it is me working with the counseling teams to interpret the data. So we're having a little bit of trouble with that. When we can get the data, how we want to view it, it's good data. We can dig down to kids. We're identifying kids, um, especially more of that internalizing, kids that might be a little more anxious like we were talking about that weren't on our radar are self-reporting, um, but the actual charts and digging in the data is a little cumbersome. So I'm trying to work with Hannah and on that. Questions so far on what it is? Um, this is district-wide trends, um, and I will get into each building. But I can tell you across the district, well, first of all, we've had pretty stable scores from winter of last year to fall of this year. So there's those three testing rounds. So the areas that we've been strong in, we continue to be strong in. The areas that we are a little weaker in, we continue to be a little bit weaker. And just if you were to look at the entire district, um, like I said, you can break it down by grade level, you can break it down by student. Um, we're strong in supportive relationships, uh, social awareness and kindness to each other. To me, I want to cheer about that, right? That's the kind of kids I want my kids to be. That's the kind of kids we want to raise here in Trumansburg. Um, we have a lot of needs in emotion regulation. Some of those questions are things like, uh, when I get in a bad mood, when I get upset, I'm able to easily pull myself out of that. A lot of our kids are rating not really to that, or I struggle with that. So um, as we go along, I'll talk to you a little bit more about how we're using this data to work on classroom lessons and pulling in groups and things like that. Um, I put a little visual at the bottom. I love this little toast visual. Um, that, <laughs> I know people do. I love the toast visual. Um, that is from Ruler. So hand in hand, do you remember that we started a social emotional screener? We're also in our first year of Roller, our third year doing it, but our first year with students in doing Ruler, which is our social emotional curriculum. So we take this data, we're saying, okay, let's look at that curriculum and see where we need to hit again, right? Emotion regulation. We need to go into classes. We need to pull kids and look at that a little bit more. Questions about that? Uh, this is high school, so I didn't put every bit of data up here. Certainly, if you want a follow up and you want a graph for every grade level, I, I could do that. Um, you're looking a little fatigued after almost two hours of presentation. So, <laughs> no, it's good to go nice last. Nice job reading the room. Good to go last. I was reading the room. I was reading the room. Um, so, what I did is put just some overall points on here, but I am happy to follow up, or if anybody wants that, even email to them, I could do that. Um, for each of the schools, I put a few points. And then I tried to put an example of the data that we get. So the data that we get can be bar graphs. It can be the triangle, like we saw with iReady. It can be um, a percentage strength, or it could be free response. So I thought it'd be interesting for the high school. I know that we presented this at the faculty meeting at the high school, too. Um, after the, those short um, multiple choice questions or Likert scale uh, questions, there's a free response where kids can answer something to be really interesting responses. Um, thinking about everything in your life right now, 
what feels the hardest for you. And then it, it analyzes what they wrote. Certainly we go through and read every response too and comes up with the strongest ones that come up. So this was a conversation that we had at a high school faculty meeting. You know, you see things like homework, friends, college, sports, assignments. You know, our, our kids are telling us that they're stressed, right? That they have a lot on their plate. So we began a nice discussion about um, tier one intervention. What, what can we do about that? If our students are telling us that they're stressed with everything that's not the answer right now, but that's the conversation we're having. You know, two things we can lessen their stress while teaching them stress management techniques, right? So mm -hmm. are these, this is actually true if we forget a grandma is that big on the <laughs> right. mind. We have some, I'm saying this on YouTube right now, some hard stressful grandmas, yeah. Well, I'm happy we passed this yeah. this this thing earlier today to help some grandmas who maybe financially. Oh my God, Jim, nice, <laughs> nice connection. I'm recognizing that for some of our students, their grandparents are, are their primary, 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 primary yeah. Yeah. so sure. that, yeah, most appropriate for them. So, so the a question I had was in, mm -hmm. in, piggybacking on 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 Pam and the idea that that that, that data was one snapshot and maybe mm -hmm. not reflective. Of, well, how reflective is this data? It's very positive, but is that what you're seeing in the high school? Mm -hmm. Are you seeing students with stronger mental health? I mean, what is what are your teachers seeing? What is your what are your can I saying? say real quick what? Because Paul Penick said it feels story. like an overstatement. I asked maybe. Paul Penick. It's like, can you give me a couple of statements? Like, you know, you're the psychologist at the high school, right? You psychologists know everything. So, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, what what, you? what do you think? Mean, yeah, what do you think about this data? And he said, you know. I feel so proud that we're raising and building kids who respect each other, because if you look over on that strength side, look at that strength in interpersonal relationships, and I can disagree with someone else in a respectful manner. Um, I like to talk more about how the students are in general at the high school, but um, I think they thought it life. was reflective of what they were seeing in general. It's, okay, so we have but, Danny, you had a follow-up piece there. Well, it just it's super positive. And there, I'm that I'm not I'm not I have no intention of criticizing or diminishing that, which I think is great, but it's definitely out of line with what we're hearing about what teenagers are experiencing to be. So I want to make sure that especially in this arena, that we're not we're having the same consideration for the data we're having with ELA here. Okay, that's a great, a great question. I can tell you it's not all positive, right? right? So if you look in the needs. We had stress, right? We also had that pulling yourself out of a bad mood. 23, so one in four of our kids is saying, I need help pulling myself out of a bad mood. Um, in the last slide, I talk about intervention, but I can talk about it now. So we dug down to individual students, right? It's gonna color code them. And they, you know, the two things that really work are connection, right? Having, you know, that's a protective factor to have a connection with an adult. Um, and instruction. So we're looking at those two things, you know, pulling those students who scored low, especially the ones that weren't on our radar already, and making an individual connection with them. Again. I, I want to just point out that I don't see food insecurity on this, and that's quite amazing that, that mm -hmm. kids are not stressed because they don't have food. And another thing is I don't see money listed on that that i don't know was this multiple choice or these are their own words because for They're all the work. work that the district is doing to feed our students and in the last year we had the the grant that everybody ate for free mm -hmm. it 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 shows here that i mean if you're hungry you will mention it and so if, if it if it's not here it's a nice feeling and i hope that mm -hmm. It will continue. And as far as participation rate, I didn't pull those percentages, but it's really high. I mean, I'd say there's a handful of kids that are very good to me. So I can respond in terms of your question, looking at the data and holistically, what do we see in terms of our students? Uh, what I see right now is that um, it's been, I'm now the first year in high school, so it's been five years, um, almost six since I've been in a high school. Um, and certainly with my, my background as a, as a school counselor in my previous years, I would say in terms of connections that I've seen with, with the counselor between our counselors here in district and then outside support that students are reaching out. Um, they're making connections with their adults. But what I see as a whole is that students are relearning how to be academic. 
what does that look like to experience homework, um, you know, and really extended projects and going on field trips and juggling all of the different events and, and so sports and musicals and it's a lot. And so I think that we're doing a lot of education, not only you know, the curriculum, but how to be effective student, you know, how to balance things. Uh, so emotionally uh, relearning, socially relearning, making good healthy choices. So there's a lot of that. That's how I try to frame that for um, for our adults as well. Uh, that we're doing a lot of educating. And so, do I think that yes, we are aligning with those strengths? But does it does that happen every day for our students? No. Uh, you know, and it, it, it's it's February, and we recognize how that might feel for some students and adults. Um, and so, you know, I, I take a look at this, and this is one again another piece of the pie for us to reflect on, and. and and then we look at how can we provide uh, supports for students. And then we're also gearing up for our next round of data as well. Yeah, we'll start after February break. Well, that's a very general response I just provided, but again, I think it's important for us to recognize where our students are. And then we get a lot of feedback directly from our adults you know, in, the, in the classroom too, and get a sense of where they are. And our teachers are great. We're, you know, we're a small school, we're roughly 278 students right now. And teachers have a really good sense if you look at our ratios as far as students to um, adults in the classroom. And if they have concerns, they're reaching out to our companies out as well. Other questions? On this? Um, middle school data was looking um, similar in the strengths. Uh, this one I put a bar graph. I don't find this as easy to interpret, but um, so basically uh, the high ones, the green ones are strengths, right? So that's saying that's a high strength. This would be overall for the entire middle school. I didn't break it down by grade. Um, the lighter green is a strength. The yellow is a need and the red is a high need. The three areas there are the three areas that we assess, challenging feelings, positive feelings, and supportive relationships. Those combine into those two categories, so they have different questions. So there weren't five overall categories. All the questions that were in the three, it's just like recalculated a little bit different. Um, so looking at this data, I had said before that supportive relationships if you look at supportive relationships, we only have 15%, I'm sorry to put the numbers next to those, I haven't heard about, only 15% that came up as a need, right? So our students are saying, those questions say things like, if I feel like I need to talk to an adult in school, there's someone that I can go and talk to. I feel like if I'm struggling with this, I know what to do when I'm in school someone will listen to me. So again, our students are feeling like the adults in the schools are supporting this would be specifically middle school, but it was a strength for all three buildings. If you compare that over to that far area, challenging feelings, and again, I'm sorry to put the percentages on there, that top percentage where it was a high strength is only 10%. Those lower two categories, the yellow and the red, is 43%. So I think 43% compared to 15%, so triple the amount of kids are saying, I struggle with managing my own feelings. Yeah, I'm someone I go talk to about that, but I'm self reporting that I get mad probably more than I think I should. Or when I get mad, I'm not able to pull myself out of it. That's kind of typical middle school a little bit, right? But I need one of those supportive adults to help me. With that. So we've really been um, looking at doing our classroom interventions, our social emotional learning around that, right? Around some you know, growth mindset and some calming strategies, all those things towards what do you do if you know, it's okay to, to drop in your mood or to escalate in your mood, but you need to start to learn to manage that. You know. Questions on that? How would have been easier if I put the percentages? <laughs> Green's good, red's bad. Red is an area for us to work on. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> is an opportunity for growth. <laughs> red is opportunity for growth. <laughs> 
question that he, are you surprised on this? I don't know, Gina, if you want to say anything about it. School. They're all emotional, right? Like if they were, I, I have twins in middle school, so we were like, yeah, we're part of that. Middle school, four of us all have kids. In I don't, I don't have much to say other than yes, schoolers need to work on emotional regulation. <laughs> They're very aware of that. Um, but as Angie um, pointed out, you know, this is a program that we're rolling out, and I think there's a lot of uh, positive feedback we've gotten from the survey so far. And you had experience with Panorama and Groton, right? Yeah, I did. And we did some of the same things The uh, middle school SST team and I went out and interviewed the students who reported low strengths in SEL, just had really brief hallway conversations with them to check in. Some of them told us they didn't pay much attention to the survey, but they knew we were listening and others shared, you know, feedback on their course schedules or interpersonal relationships that they were struggling with. And that was good feedback for us to know about too. How much of this data that these kids report actually comes from their home life because these past few years have been very challenging for many people that that um i'm sure there are many adults who feel like they would have room for growth opportunities for growth i don't know also i'm going to say i don't know if it matters right because once they're here i don't mean that disrespectful but once they're here if they are here and they're saying, I'm struggling with managing my emotions, we want to teach that. Just like if you're struggling with learning to read or in you know, math or any of that, you know, we're going to directly teach some strategies for that. So I don't have a way to tease that out. I can say in supportive relationships, there's at least three questions. One is I have an adult that I trust and can go to. One is I have a friend who I feel like I can trust and go to. A good friend, I don't think it's his best friend, a good friend. And one is when I'm home, I have someone like I, I didn't break that up by question on here, but overall it's strong. So I'm thinking if that was really all of our data would be like that. Right. That's a good answer. Next is elementary school. So this is a third way we can look at the data. Um, so the percentage that you see all the way to the right is the percentage of overall strength. So you want that number to be high, right? Green, good, red, opportunity for growth. So um, just kind of looking down, remember K2 is teacher reported, right? So teachers are saying, they go through each student and say, um, I feel like they have awareness of others. They're able to interact in a group. Uh, when they get upset or don't get their way, they're able to pull out of that. Um, third and fourth is a self-report. I did break down uh, fourth grade a little bit more because you know, certainly that stands out. Um, so if we look at fourth grade, actually Megan Vanessa made this. Um, so this is fourth grade. Mm -hmm. She included the percentages. Look, I know that's because <laughs> Megan did it right. Yeah, Megan my, did all my stuff. It would look really, really nice. <laughs> Maybe as a board, you could vote on that. Megan does all my graphs. Um, so this is the three areas, right? Emotion, regulation, supportive relationships, and positive feelings. So when you look at this, right? So their number is really low. And then you look at the charts, um, you can really see that the emotion regulation is the one that skewed it. So what you want is green, right? It to be a high strength. The orange is a medium. Wait, I'm sorry, hold on. Yeah, the green is a high strength, the purple is a strength, and she, she even worded it nice, it's like a medium strength, and then a, a low strength, she didn't say it was a mean, it's just a low strength. Um, so if we look at that, again, it's emotion regulation that's really pushing that into the red. Okay, quite it's a few pre middle times. school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm very familiar with this fourth grade so <laughs> mm -hmm. A lot of drama. This is all recess. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> boss recess. Um, no, I've had a lot of conversations with Megan, and she's doing all the all the counseling teams are, but she's doing a phenomenal job at tweaking, you know, the lessons and tailoring the lessons. She's dug into a ruler um, and really pulled out some of those. Like, all right, I got to go back in and supplement in fourth grade some of these things maybe i covered it before but we got to hit this hard right now this is the things that they're struggling with. Mm -hmm. last slide i think we've talked about each of this 
but uh, you know, to me, this is the most important part, not what your data is, but what you're doing with your data. Um, so two ways that I look at social emotional data that we can help, like I said, is connection, right? It's the number one supportive factor for kids is having a connection in school, wanting to come to school, wanting to perform well and feeling safe here. So like Jean said, I love that model that they took every kid that came up in the red and had made a personal connection with them. Hey, I want you to know that we read your survey, you reported this, what can we do to help, right? What's going on? Um, and instruction, right? You need to teach these skills just like you're teaching academic skills. So um, we know the three-tiered model, we've really hit hard on tier one and tier two. Um, I think we have a pretty strong tier three model. We're well supported in mental health, but our goal is not to have that many kids in tier three. So by really hitting your interventions, tier one classroom, right? Tier two small groups are a little bit uh, more than what you're getting in the classroom. Your goal is to decrease those kids that are very needy. So across the board, it was a little bit different in each building. Um, they are looking at classroom lessons uh, from ruler and from other sources based on this data and um, some systems things and uh, really identifying kids who struggle. I would say the other thing across the board I said it before was it, it does seem to be doing a very good job at picking up students who um, were more internalizing, right? Maybe they've got high grades, maybe they're always coming to school and they're performing well, but the the, their self-reporting some feelings of anxiety and depression. Any questions? Can we have an email copy of this? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can send it to you. Thank you. Um, I'll just wrap up just at the end by saying, you know, like we look at our students individually in real time. So like, Megan made a great point just a, a little bit ago. Our kids have been through a pandemic and they're relearning how to come to school and how to sit in the classroom and how to do homework. And they, they forgot some of that stuff. It wasn't a normal thing for a couple of years. So that impacts not only Angie's data, but that impacts their academic data too. So, you know, we want to look at them as a whole person, not just as one of those numbers up there. So one of the things that we've been looking at is a data dashboard that will integrate all of our data in one place. So we can pull up a student and see all of this stuff in one place about one student. So we can look at the whole picture and not just it putting it in silos. So hopefully we're going to take that step too, and that will be really helpful information too. So we can look at students as a whole person. And, and I can definitely send this to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, You're Thank you all, everybody. <laughs> all right, so now we are going into privilege of the floor. And I think we we have Maureen signed up. Is there anybody up there? Um, nope. This is a lot of data that you went over and talking about our um, children in the educational system and pretty much it pertained to the first three goals and more of the responsibility I'd like to address tonight is the goal four and where we talk about policy and what can the board do to um, um, better improve um, adherence and compliance with policy so that you have a way too of um, looking at data and measuring it. And I use as an example, um, the um, field trip form that is filled out for um, the um, advisors to submit to you for approval. Um, Kimberly and I have had numerous email conversations and she said to stay tuned because she's looking to um, correct some of that information that was provided to you. Um, so I just wrote down a few thoughts about this. In particular, I'm looking at the goals as they were presented here tonight. It pertains to goal number four about um, and how do you measure that data when you can't identify certain students and um, marginalization of students when you're looking at just numbers and you don't identify the students. So it's with respect that I, you know, I think um, 
Stacy Nugent and Kimberly for the focus on the current field trip approval process, ensuring its compliance with policy. The board list setting of policy is the second of their three main responsibilities. I would suggest the statement should be expanded to include insurance and compliance as well. I was interested to learn more about the proposed trip and found a link for the program the students will engage in at the UN. It is an excellent opportunity for these students. So I extend a special kudos to the teachers that have dedicated extra time to plan for this opportunity. That said, it was two of the 13 program offerings that piqued my interest and had me look at the opportunity through the lens of your DEI policy. The two programs I reference are, first, social economic inequality, and second, is development of education in different parts of the world. The questions they will explore, I will share with you, and I suggest they are ones that could be applied to this situation as well. How does one's economic status impact their access to education? How does public school funding affect the quality of education? What are private institutions like versus public institutions? How does free education given by the government benefit? And what inequalities in education exist globally? Why do these inequalities exist? What solutions have been put forward to address these inequalities? And which of them have succeeded, if any? So let's think about this global issue locally as it pertains to this opportunity for this trip. The DEI policy prescribes action to be taken by this district to ensure that equitable, inclusive, and diverse educational opportunities are available to all. It identifies one socioeconomic class as a protected group, but the field trip policy and form that you review does not address that. Implementing district goals and ensuring compliance with policy is a complex and never ending process. The Board of Ed needs to be engaged in this and support the administration team and teachers with due diligence, trust but verify, as the saying goes, the devil is in the details. Tonight's request is for an excellent educational opportunity for eight students in the 11th and 12th grades. I wonder why only eight students are able to attend. How many students is this available to in those grades? That information is lacking from the form, but it is required by policy so that you can be sure that it's been offered to all. The form that's been developed for Board of Ed review and trip approval fails the litmus test for ensuring an inclusive and equitable opportunity has been considered and reviewed. It is lacking questions to provide the necessary information. The policy and the form generally contain the procedural aspects of field trips, but the manner in which field trips are funded does not ensure an equitable access, inclusion, or the opportunity to learn that must be provided to all students. The language in the district's policy is not sensitive to families, financial and security. Under the fundraising section, it speaks only to families as being not interested or non-responsive, but we must ask why are they not interested or responsive? Is their financial situation a barrier? Field trips enrich what happens in the classroom Finding some way to level the playing field is important. These two chaperones are dedicated, engaged, and exceptional educators, and they are doubling their workload by chaperoning these students and also preparing lesson plans for their classroom during their absence. The four days that they will be away provide a most valuable enriching educational experience to the eight that will attend the conference. How will that be replicated by those students not able to take part in this event? For this trip, I wonder what other avenues of funding were explored other than the individuals funding their trip costing $750. The club's cash balance sheet says they are just shy of $1,500. $750 is a big ticket item in a family's budget. Was a grant from the Education Foundation applied for, or could the BOCES COSER for exploratory enrichment aid have been accessed for this trip? 
Looking at spreadsheets that BOCES provides for other such aidable trips and most likely could have been, I ask that the Board of Ed consider their mission statement that states you will be leaders in continuous innovation and equitable opportunities for all and apply this mission to the field trip opportunities in review of the policy and the forms that would give you the appropriate information to know that you are making this successful to all. Thank you. Anyone else have any other comments? Yeah, just really briefly. So, sorry, um, Joey the I'm a teacher in elementary school. And normally when I'm here taking the notes, I don't speak up. So sorry for making me and this much longer. I just wanted to circle back to um, Angie's really eloquent presentation of the data and talking about how strong connections with students are so, so important for a protective factor for a whole range of social emotional issues. And just want to point out how much of that um, really does come on a day-to-day -day basis from our staff. Um, and the reason I'm speaking up is because we had a staff member this week who came to me was, and was looking for um, a way to access counseling for themselves and was disappointed that they we don't have an employee assistance program through BOCES, um, which was something she had had in a prior, uh, prior BOCES placement at GST. Um, so she's, she is recognizing within herself that she needs a little help. You know, we're all struggling. You know, um, I think all humans are still feeling the effects of the last few years, and uh, teachers are taking on that burden from their students as well. So um, I'm not asking you for anything specific right now, except for that. Um, as we move forward and we are moving away from the, um, the acute trauma of COVID and, and remote learning and all of these things, we recognize that this trauma kind of that we're seeing in our students and we're seeing reflected in social emotional scores and we're seeing reflected in academic scores also rest heavy on our teachers. And as a district and a very supportive community, I would ask that we continue to really look at our staff and, and make sure we're supporting them continuing to do the things that we've done to support over the last years. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Lee. Um, anyone else? So I don't think we have any any other participants online. So I will move on to consent agenda. And if the board agrees, I will take Items six A through G. Can you read it all really slowly, every single point? <laughs> G. Yes. G is coming out. Yes. Yeah. All right. Any others? All right. So. Um, may I have a motion to approve item 6A through F? So moved. Second. Who was the first and second? Megan Tanya. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. All right. Approval of the 2023-2024 district calendar. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education for the Trumansburg Central School District hereby approves the 2023-2024 district mm -hmm. calendar <laughs> as presented. We have a motion. Second. And discussion. Um, yeah, I pulled this just because there were some questions on it, including by a resident. And so I just wanted to go over um, what we know, and Kimberly, please feel free to correct me if I get this wrong. So, um, so basically, you know, when I first look at this calendar as a parent, all I see are the more like vacation days. Um, and so the, the question is, why does it look like that? Um, because there's more vacation days around Memorial and also over the um, Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving break and then also December. January break. And so the answer basically is, if I understand everything correctly, that the school year is actually much longer because the regents exams are scheduled later this year. And so that's adding extra days at the end, um, which allows um, for more vacation days in the middle. 
Um, in addition, we're actually scheduling two fewer total days. So we're required by the state to have 180 days. This past year, we scheduled 184 because what happens are things like snow days. So we always like do more in case we have to have snow days. So this year, so what normally happens is if we have extra days because we haven't used all the extra for snow days, um, we give them back as a memorial break, typically, mm -hmm. like in May. Mm -hmm. So, but right. this coming, is that, am I good so far, Kimberly? You're doing a great job, Stacey. Okay. <laughs> and so what we're going to do this year instead, in order to give parents the ability to plan in advance, is to, um, is to schedule only 182 days and just put the Memorial Day ones right in the schedule to start with. And then if we were to need more than two snow days, we, uh -huh. would, actually, we would actually then take days off the Memorial Day break. But historically, we have not been using more than two. So we're pretty safe, likely. I thought of that the second I said it. <laughs> so that's all I had. I just wanted to explain that. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah. All Is it marked on the calendar anywhere that those days would be the buyback days? Yeah, give back days. It should be yeah. at the very bottom. Thing. It's on the bottom for April, but for for the, the days that you're asking about in May, the, the give back days here it says in April. So are, are, Tina, does it say April? In this case, April. can we make that alteration? In this case, we would actually pull them from the Memorial Day. Thank you. Okay, sorry. No. <laughs> all right, so with that change, um, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Nomination for representation of the TST uh, OCs. Be it resolved that the Board of Education for the Trinidad Central School District hereby nominates. Wait, I thought this we was. Have to pull. Gonna We're going to have to pull it unless somebody wants to volunteer right now. Would any. No. I'll make a motion to uh, table that item. Second. Mm -hmm. er, yeah. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the table. Right. Opposed. Same motion carried. Approval of field trip. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation for the Truman's Work Central School District, or sorry, recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education for the Truman's Work Central School District, hereby approves the Global Humanism Club trip to New York City from March 13th through March 16th as presented. So moved. And second? Second. Can I speak very briefly regarding the field trip? Um, Please so, do. Okay, thank you. Uh, so as far as the field trip, um, so thank you for taking an extensive look at our field trip process. Um, I have to say that and I mentioned this earlier, when we're relearning school and, and how to be a stellar athlete and musician, that for our students to have an opportunity to go back on these trips, whether it's an extension of the classroom or a club, it really does bring their high school experience to a whole different level. And so we're working really closely with the faculty to identify more opportunities for our students. And so it is extra work, of course, but there's so much value. Mm -hmm. um, and so in this particular trip, the last trip um, that Jane George helped the coordinator, the coordinator, I should say, was in 2019. And I think she actually did a presentation. I was here uh, when she did that presentation in terms of the experience for the students. All students on that trip attended um, all on fundraising. So no one had any outside uh, cost for that trip. It was estimated the trip was about $700 to $750 per student. Recognizing the change in our process with the field trip form and, and policy and practice, it does require that we have the field trip form submitted and approved two months in advance. 
And so in my conversations with teachers and advisors, recognizing that there is the, the time piece is essential, we are sometimes in a position where we have to estimate cost. And so in this particular trip, uh, Jane could not register the students in the program until we have board of ed approval. And so there is money from previous years and that accounts, and we recognize it is a substantial amount of money, but Jane has a specific plan um, and how we would address that and make this opportunity available for all students who are interested. So currently Global Humanism is a class here in the high school, and there's also a club attached to this. And so if students want to go, we absolutely will support them with that process. Um, and I sat down and worked through logistics with Jane George, to ensure that all students have uh, this equal opportunity. Uh, it is an amazing uh, event and experience for our students, and I appreciate you taking the time to look at that. Uh, I also want to say that I, I heard your words, uh, Maureen, trust but verify, and I do, I do appreciate that and, and recognize the importance for us to follow through on detail. But I will also say that if we are pushing back and recognizing the needs of our teachers and all the things they're trying to balance. If there's so much that's in their way of making these trips happen, I worry that teachers will not move forward for these opportunities. So I recognize the balance that we need and making sure we're aligning with our policy. And I mentioned this at the last um, board meeting, but I think it's important for us to recognize the, the full picture and the work that we're doing for our students. So thank you. And bottom line, you know, we're always in it for kids. So Absolutely. The teachers stop having to put all that effort in, and so they stop their kids. Right. So thank, thank you for it's always a lot. Thank you for considering everything here, and we're we're really trying to make sure that we're giving our students an opportunity to recognize the world outside of Trumansburg as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think it also needs to be said that the limited number of students that sometimes participate is based on the enrollment in that particular class. So um, it wouldn't necessarily be open to the entire high school. It, it's really based on those students taking that instruction, uh, that particular program or class. Thank you. The, the, for, the policy does ask you to give that information so we would know that. It is the expectation um, for this trip that it will be fully funded by the club, even That's though their goal. the club doesn't have the money. So currently we have the, as we know, in the extracurricular quarterly reports. So we have that uh, stated there, but in working with Jane George and our fundraising opportunities, the goal is in addition to that, that we will be fundraising to make sure that we have met that 100% for all students. So fundraising six thousand dollars in the next month. So our goal is to make that happen. We have a plan. And and what if that goal is not met? Then we'll have to reevaluate whether we can make this happen. So so, so is that the idea? So uh, you know, for me, it's just I, I just want a clear picture of, of what's going on. Sure. Like that's it. Like, and I'm not getting a clear picture of what's going on from what's being submitted on the form. And recognizing that in the past, they haven't been able to fundraise, fundraise over the last two years. And mm -hmm. we haven't gone on trips. And so we're trying to reestablish and get our clubs in a position where we can support students. But we do not want students in a position where they have to spend $500 to go on a trip. That's not really good. Right. And so I think, I think all that's required here is just a little bit more transparency when filling out the form. I, it's not, I don't think it's a lot. I'd like more. to bring a motion for the previous question. All those in favor. What? I don't know if that means I'm sorry. we're voting. That approve. means that we're oh, voting we'll at this time to, to move on the field trip. All those in favor to move on the field trip. Can we can't. The proper way would be to call the question and then we vote. I think that's um, what Joanna just did. I just I just asked to move to the previous question, which is to move on the field trip. So all those in favor of moving on the field trip. So for the, the field, field trip. trip. Will we approve the field trip? Is the question. That's the resolution on the table right now to move on approving the field trip or not. So I'm asking all those in favor. So is that different than calling the question? No, it's the same thing. That's calling the question. 
Okay, so to interrupt conversation. Yes, I can do that. Okay, and then how many people need to approve the interruption of the discussion in order for it to pass? For the for the interruption, no one to actually approve the field trip is what I'm asking for. So it'd be a regular vote. So all those in favor? Any opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. Acceptance of donation. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education for the Trumansburg Central School District, hereby accepts the donation from Catherine and Brian Mills Millspa mm -hmm. of $100 to pay down balance on school lunch account as presented. We have a motion. Motion. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Thank you for that mm -hmm. donation. Nice thought. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Acceptance of donation, be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education for the Trumansburg Central School District hereby accepts the donation of a motorized wheelchair and charger valued at $1,500 from Gail Battles to support student needs. Thank you. It's a very generous gift. Thank, Thank you very much. Yes, super, uh, super helpful. Sure, mm -hmm. regulations can be very interesting. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. Approval of Board of Education retreat. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education for the Trumansburg Central School District hereby approves the Board of Education retreat on March 8, 2023, from 3.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. in the High School Library for Professional Development as presented. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. Superintendent of Schools authorizations. Be it resolved that the Board of Education for the Trumansburg Central School District hereby grants the Superintendent of School authority to transfer funds so long as the transfer amount for any one item does not exceed fifty thousand within the budgeted for the 2022-2023 school year. No. Second. Discussion. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carry. Authorization for the district treasurer to transfer funds. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education for the Trumansburg Central School District hereby authorizes the district treasurer to transfer 82,000 from the elementary school teacher budget line to the special education tuition budget line as presented. So moved. Second. Discussion. So we'll just briefly explain. So the issue in this case is we just received a bill for a very high cost student. I don't want to go into any detail about the student because it's private. But we have a very high cost special education student. This money is needed to pay the tuition bill for that program. That, that tuition bill is ultimately aidable and we will see this money come back to the district through stack. But for now, we have to have the money in the, in the line to be able to pay the bill. Um, so it's really just that simple. Um, the good news is that we have a little bit of margin built into a teacher salary line because of grant funds that have come in. So I have the ability to move that money to cover this bill. We will be fine as far as the budget goes long term. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. Authorization for district treasurer to transfer funds and close an account. 
be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education, for the Trumanburg Central School District, hereby authorizes the district treasurer to transfer $236,804.87 from the 2017 Capital Reserve Fund to the 2022 Capital Reserve Fund and to close the 2017 Capital Reserve Fund account as presented. Motion. Second. Discussion. So 2017, we we have to close, correct? Yeah, we've used, we've essentially used it up with the current project. Now that the project is coming to an end, we don't need that reserve anymore, and it makes sense to move it forward to the new fund. It's a it's a transaction of on record, but in essence, all that money is in the same bank account anyway. So all those in favor. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. And now at this time we have a privilege, second privilege of the floor. Anyone? Just a question is um, so you're talking about opting out. How many was there a increase in homeschooling students at the beginning of COVID? And how many of them may have come back? And are they in that data? You can't answer me now because you're not supposed to talk to me. But if you could yeah, answer like that and get that information back to share next time. I can not. Thanks. And at this thank well, you. Just thank, a you. thank you to John today for his time in um, talking about socioeconomic needs to making sure that the lines have been corrected in the budget for the nurses discretionary funds. So now they know what money they have in the proper line. So thank you for working through that with the um, OCs people today too. Thanks. Thank you. And now board form. Hi. So last year, John, it was in the springtime and it was um, a presentation that that we had. Um, and on the slide, the graphic that was used for um, the presentation was the our school seal, the district wide one that was very the waterfall, the waterfall and stuff. I, I would like to to um, welcome that back into um, our presentation graphics when we are uh, doing non-athletic presentations because the mascot that we are seeing is the athletic mascot, the Blue Raider, but the district one that's been around for over seventy five years and was uh, was a little bit polished a few years ago, it would be nice if that that would be used in district communications and also in in even presentations that are uh, dealing with school rather than just specifically uh, athletics. Just a suggestion since we have that. So and another thing I know, I, I, I'm actually going to ask Jean, Jeannie Wiggins, being Mrs. Day, good day, Mrs. Day, to to comment on how incredible the musical was for your building, and I have to say that Mrs. Amy West did an incredible job with 127 students. And the second show, yeah. you even made a cameo appearance on stage. So <laughs> please, uh, for we those did, of you who didn't see it, let's let's hear it. For we had an amazing show. So out of the entire third and fourth grades, we only had 10 students not participate, which means all of the other students either had a part or stage crew or helped with something. And Amy West was masterful in um, having students coming in and practicing and then at the end putting it all together. And we did have a couple students who ended up being sick for the second show. So I was in the show. <laughs> did you get a t-shirt? I did. Yeah. Were you hoozy what or were you? I was hey. Hey. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So, it, but um, I, I can't say enough about Amy West and the, the skill that she has. I mean, before the show, before they all come out um, and they look like they have it all together, they're all in the gym and she even has them 
you know, they're doing breathing exercises like 120 kids at a time. Um, the amount of energy is palpable. So I just can't say enough about her skill. I want to add that we had um, we had approved uh, in extracurricular assignments. There is a uh, a stipend associated with that elementary school musical. I don't know when that is going to be up for review again, but if there is an individual getting paid that for doing all that work with two grades, I, I hope that, that it, it will be something that will be looked at in the future because it was very well received. It was wonderful. And we had packed houses both nights, which is why we did two nights. Thank you. So I actually just wanted to ask John, I don't know if you know, just the question of EAP. I, I wanted to support that completely and wondered what maybe the next step would be, or if just you could give some information for that. So if not, that's fine too. Just very briefly, I can share that there was, at one point we did subscribe to that, but what we found was is that I don't think anybody ever took advantage of it because our healthcare plan has with it built into it free counseling and that there are as a as one of the benefits and I don't know exactly how it I don't want to say I shouldn't say free because I don't know like there's probably there may be a copay, but I know that there is a benefit for counseling within our healthcare insurance. That's why we had stepped away from it years ago, but I don't know presently that's something that Kimberly and I would have to explore so I can with tell our you options from experience that our healthcare also covers those. But EAP is very different, and you don't have to be on a waiting list. You can call up, and your six sessions are available right away. So you bypass a waiting list, and it's a short term. Um, so if it's not the long term, and it's not, you're not on some six month list, maybe. maybe we're, That's we're, just definitely something. Kimberly and I will certainly. Yeah, know no, I would, I would want to. Having heard that. the question, I already made a note that we just want to look into it and see what the costs are, and if that's something that we could bring forward. Mm -hmm. All right. So may I have a motion to adjourn? Please. For um, board forum, the March meetings were canceled for the board retreat. Oh, thank you. And then we're going to look to see what people's calendars look like to reschedule those if we want to reschedule. I think it was community engagement and the policy. policy. Mm -hmm. Should we do it with Kimberly? Kimberly, can you you have your calendar there too? Or I can send out a doodle tomorrow. Yeah, yes, I think that's more efficient. Okay. okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Till next time. I have a motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. Are you motioning to adjourn over there, Gene? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone over there, Gene, motion Kimberly. to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> we would have motioned a while. Our virtual, our virtual <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? Same. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks.